It's 7 p.m. here in Ventnor City, New Jersey, at our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and it's Saturday night with Car Edge with your hosts, me, Ray, and, well, Zach. How are you today, handsome? Doing great. Happy Saturday, y'all. Tonight's show brought to you by us, damn it, CarEdge.com. If we can help you out, my dad and I, four years and running now trying to help you avoid dealers and hassle and get them serious savings. Tonight, Pops, I want to kick off with Toyota. Now, why would I kick off with Toyota? I want to know. Our attention? I, yeah, I want to know. And turn our attention to Ford? Why? Ford? Toyota? Ford? Who, who, what, what's going on, Zach? Ford made huge waves in the industry earlier this week that announcing a yes. pullback on EV production, a pullback on investments in EV facilities, and a doubling down on what? What did you say out there? I couldn't hear you. A doubling down on what? Hybrids. <laughs> hybrids. What automaker has been all in on hybrids from, I don't know, day one? Shocking, but it might be Toyota. Which automaker has the lowest day's supply of new vehicles? I'm covering it up intentionally. Who do you think has the lowest day's supply of new vehicle inventory, folks? Guess it. Uh, Screaming king, from the rooftops. The king of hybrids, Toyota? And which automaker has an oversupply of inventory? So much so that they yes. actually revived their stair-step incentive program that is dreaded by their dealer body. Would that be, would that be Fode? And that's the show, folks. There you go. Toyota shocks the industry by being right again. Okay, thanks going for all in on by, hybrids. And gentlemen. <laughs> going all in on hybrids. Now everyone is trying to catch up and join them at the party. Dad, I'm I'm in disbelief a little bit right now on the news that we saw this week with Ford essentially doubling back on their EV commitment and instead saying, no, we're going to focus on hybrids. Toyota, and we could really throw Honda into the mix here as well. They've been one step ahead of their competitors for the past two, three years, and it shows right about now. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, Toyota took a slightly different approach to everything. Uh, had quite a bit to do with their CEO, who they forced out uh, because they didn't think he was being aggressive enough uh, towards uh, moving in the direction of, of full battery electric vehicles. Um, but apparently, apparently, he had a better sense of what the future was going to be than uh, many others in the automotive industry and uh, many uh, politicians around the world. So, so uh, yes, I guess in that sense, Zach, I am, I am, I am, I am shocked. I am just so, I mean, I'm afraid to touch anything. I, I mean, the keys to my, everything is just it, the whole damn, you, you know, what would shock the world? What would shock the world? I don't know if we had a straight up headline one day. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. However, Dad, I do think there's a really interesting story here, and that is the all-in EV approach is not necessarily working. I'll pull back up the day's supply of inventory once more, and let's look at that together. Automakers who have gone all-in on, you know, like bypassing hybrid powertrains, Ford on there, 104 days supply. That doesn't work. That absolutely doesn't work. We know that many other automakers, Mercedes-Benz in the luxury lane, 91 days supply. And so it's been the same story, will continue to be the same story. And I think it's especially true when you go and you start using the car search and you and you look in your neighborhood. There are no, there's a significantly less, lesser volume of inventory that's hybrid powertrain. And the price point we know is more attainable for folks there as well. There's been all sorts of research. Edmunds has put co uh, content out. Cox has put content out. It is cheaper to buy a hybrid than it is to buy yes. an internal combustion engine vehicle or a battery electric vehicle. And so I think in many ways, the headline, yeah, sure, it's a little bit crazy. Toyota shocks the auto industry. Toyota got it right. And other automakers got it wrong. And Toyota owners... Yeah. Their vehicles are not depreciating nearly as fast as Ford owners' vehicles are, as the uh, Stellantis vehicles are, as Volkswagen or how, like Toyota they're, owners. Like they're sitting in the pole position. Well, there, there, there seems to be a little bit of history there to back that up. Um, Toyotas have been some of the slowest depreciating vehicles um, for what a couple decades now. Um, they listen. There, there's. There's a couple truisms in the car business, and hmm. that is if if you want some finely engineered vehicles, 
Okay, I mean exceedingly well-engineered vehicles. Think about your German brands, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi. If you want to get to know your service advisor on a first-name basis, those finely engineered vehicles are going to require more maintenance or have more issues than, say, an Asian-branded vehicle such as Honda, Toyota, uh, Subaru, Mazda. Now, the vehicles that have traditionally been considered to be bulletproof have been Toyotas and Hondas. I mean, that, that, has, that has been the case forever. You know, the only reason you would get to know your service advisor at a Toyota dealership is because you chose to go back there at 15,000 miles for your 15,000 mile maintenance. It's it's not because you're getting a recall notice. It's not because there's there's a, uh, an issue that, that has crept up. Um, yeah. Yes, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, fine, fine, fine automobiles. But they're they're more expensive to maintain, and they require more maintenance than most of your Asian brands. On the shock narrative, Dad, let's look. We have March sales data, and I want you to see here. I want you to take a guess before I even pull it up. Do you know what Toyota's year over year March sales gain was? And I, I it was a gain. Do you know what Toyota's March sales gain was? I, I don't remember. Was it like twenty five percent or something? Pretty doggone close, man. 22.7% price, excuse me, um, uh, sales gain year over year for Toyota. Lexus brand up 16.7%. Subaru, another brand that we don't spend enough time talking about. And interestingly, Subaru doesn't even really even have hybrid powertrain options. However, they've stayed price affordable on the internal combustion engine side of things. Uh, Mazda sales. <laughs> Bless you. Excuse me, Mazda sales only up 6.7%, which I find to be surprising. Honda sales. But that's just for March. 14. If you look at the just whole March, first yep. quarter, yeah, if you look at the whole first quarter, Mazda's up 13%. So. True. Yes. Honda for the month of March up almost 15%. And then look at that at Ford. So the brand that we're talking about here that is now pivoting their strategy to be more like Toyota, more like Honda. They were only up 4. 3 percent, and I think you and I both know a lot of that 4.3 percent gain, the 170,000 vehicles sold. A lot of those were to fleet customers, and I've got to imagine a lot of those were also service loaders. Uh, well, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna push back, and I'm gonna say that one of the reasons that their sales were up 4.3 percent in March was they had very very aggressive pricing on their electric vehicles that they offer. The um, the Lightning and the Mach-E had extremely aggressive pricing. And and I think because they, they lowered their prices on those vehicles so much, they pulled some more people into the marketplace that they might not have pulled into the marketplace had they not lowered the prices significantly. I hear you. And in the same breath, Dad, I want to try and acknowledge this. Lincoln sales were up 35.1% at the exact same time that Automotive News had an article that talked about Lincoln yes. increasing incentives to their dealers to mark vehicles as sold in a way that is not fraudulent, however, is a little bit of an eye scratcher, head scratcher, excuse me. Here's loaner program changes over at Lincoln. In addition to offering bigger discounts, Lincoln recently loosened the requirements to move vehicles through its loaner car program, telling dealers that 2023 models put into it by the end of March only have to be used for 20 days or 500 miles rather than the typical requirements of six months or 3,000 miles. Two Lincoln dealers who confirmed the program changes to Automotive News said that they are designed to artificially inflate numbers since retailers can report vehicles sold once they're put in the loaner pro uh, car program. Quote, they're just trying to get you to report them sold, said one dealer who requested anonymity for discussing an internal program. Quote, it's just a way to pad the numbers. It makes your inventory not look as bad as it is. And again, I'll flip back over here. Lincoln sales for the month of March up 35.1%. I mean, come on, man. I hear you on big discounts on Ford EVs, Ford and Lincoln or you know, Ford owns Lincoln. Like, like, that's pretty damning when you look at those two side by side, yeah, isn't but, it? But, but, you know, when you also look at 
I mean, my goodness gracious, the Lincoln dealer sold less than 10,000 vehicles in the month of March. And I don't, and I don't care if, if 3000 of those were service loaners, uh, it, they, the amount of vehicles that they produce and sell is negligible in comparison to the rest of the market. Okay? Of course, but I think the tactics are not just, you know, happening at, at Lincoln. These tactics are used. We know BMW got caught for this years ago and the SEC find them. I'm just bringing it up because I think the only numbers on here that I trust that I think are bulletproof, Dad, Honda's numbers, I think are bulletproof. Mazda number, I think is bulletproof. Subaru number, I think is bulletproof. Toyota number, I think is bulletproof. Everything else I think is being manipulated by service loaners or, or other crapola that goes on in this industry. Those are the four brands that I think are bulletproof. I think like the numbers I believe. Well, you're 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 certainly entitled to your opinion. I I you know I don't recall seeing anything. Um, you know, not that I'm here to defend Ford, um, yeah. because God knows nobody bashes on Ford more than I do. Um but I don't recall reading anything where Ford was asking their dealers to move stuff into service loaner fleet. I get it on the, on the Lincoln side of things. They're trying to make it look like, I don't know, people want some of them again. Um, You're so, so wrong, Zach. Every brand manipulates the numbers. Well, yeah, okay, that's, that's, well, that's fair. That's true. Yeah. You know, I, I take back and, everything I just said. Yeah, I, I'm sure every corporation manipulates the numbers. That's fair. Yes. You know, now how much they're manipulated, we don't know. I mean, I know when, you know, I was with Mini and Mini is part of BMW. I, I mean, I know what the shenanigans were at the end of every month when you'd get a call from your factory rep and he'd beg you and he'd go, uh, you know, come on, if you could be kind enough to, to find 10 uh, vehicles to put in the service loaner fleet, we'll pay you an extra 700. So you'd have an extra $7,500, do with it whatever you want, uh, utilize that money any, any way you see fit, or just put it in the owner's pocket. We don't care what you do with it. Just please find 10 cars that you can put in the service loaner fleet. Uh, you know, and that that goes on everywhere, okay? Um Alfa Romeo dealers were were screaming about how the numbers they they were being pushed by their factory reps to to say vehicles were sold that weren't sold. It 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 goes on with every. I mean, there's a push from the manufacturers, factory reps to the dealers, and it all you know. So who knows when anybody really hits a. Uh, a, a sales objective that's been, you know, legitimately hits that sales. Now, I will tell you this, having huh. worked for the Penske organization, being publicly traded and Mr. Penske being as concerned about how things look, um, if it wasn't sold, we couldn't report it as sold. So, you know, I mean, the Penske organization has BMW stores and, and, and uh, many stores. Um, and oftentimes they, they couldn't participate in some of these, uh, exercises, uh, because it's, you know, if you're reporting something is sold and you're a publicly traded company, well, if you report it sold and it's not that, I think that's called fraud and, For sure. and, and, and you're not supposed to do that. So yeah. I, I know at Penske, we didn't play those games. Most mom and pop stores, they play those games, uh, happily <laughs> well and be clear it's coming from the oem the reason you will continue to see from car edge all sorts of oem desperation related videos and things like that is because everyone needs to understand the market is entirely different than it was a year or two years ago these are tactics whether you care about how the industry operates behind the scenes or not these are tactics that you should be aware of that they're in practice right now because that represents buyer's market not seller's market i want to yeah. pull up your dead we're going to jump to the chat we've had a lot of really thoughtful contributions come through, and we're going to join uh, join those community members and answer their questions in just a moment. Before that, you do not have to contribute to have your chat message pulled up, so we'll start here actually with Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you. My Hyundai lease is up in a month. Are we in a strong position to negotiate a new lease or do a buyout? Now, you can talk a little bit, Dad, about what, to ha what, what your options are at the end of the lease and also well, your comments and thoughts on you know, well, strength. Well, position. typically... Um... And it had, had been this way for years and years and years. And in many cases, it, it's not this way anymore. But typically, you had three options. 
you could buy the car out at the end of the lease for what the uh, residual value was, and that value was set the day you leased the vehicle. It was It was a percentage of the manufacturer's suggested retail price based on how many miles a year you were expecting to drive. So it was a 10,000-mile-a-year lease, 12,000, 15,000, whatever it was, the residual value was based on that. And and you used to have the opportunity to be able to buy the vehicle at that number at the end of the lease if you wanted to. Some manufacturers have taken that uh, ability away. Uh, if it was the greatest car in the world and and uh, you loved it, but you, you, you wanted the newest upgraded brand, you could just turn it in and lease another vehicle. Or if, like we saw two years ago in many cases, the vehicle had a market value that was considerably higher than its residual value and by considerably 25 30 percent higher you could buy the car at the residual value sell it at the market value and stick that profit that you made between those two numbers into your pocket um so those were basically your options so if your lease is up in a month i would find out exactly what your residual value is I would then run your vehicle in the um, Car Edge Sell My Car widget to get some. CarEdge.com slash sell. Yeah, well, widget. Uh, <laughs> and, and get some offers for your vehicle in your area so that you have some idea as to what a, a dealer might pay for that. If there are a number of Hyundai dealers, two or three within a, a 40, 50 mile radius of you. Uh, you can also contact those dealers, let them know that you have a lease vehicle that would be coming due and that you're not planning on just turning it in at the end of the lease. You want to get a quote from them as to what they would buy it for so that they can have it for their used car operations. Um, and, and so now you're starting to get a real sense of what the value of that car might be, and that'll determine whether you should trade the car in and utilize whatever equity you have trading it in and putting it towards a new lease, or or trading it in and whatever equity you have taking and getting a check back for that and and then negotiate a good lease without actually putting the equity into the lease. Um you know, you have a, you have a multitude of options that way. Uh, if you Google search what to do at the end of a car lease space car edge, we will also have essentially what my dad just spoke on in written form. So if you want to go, you can debrief on that from Nick and Bricks. Thank you for that, pops. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nick and Bricks. You never talk about Subaru. Must be great cars. Subarus are awesome. I, yeah, I, right. yeah I, and we and we've been known to talk about them occasionally. Um, if you know, the cars that we talk about the most are the cars that are selling the least um, and that tend to have the most issues and the most um, on-hand supply. And Subaru doesn't necessarily fall into that category. They, they build a good quality car. Um, it is a car that for those who have Subarus, they absolutely are cult-like in their feelings towards Subaru. Um I, I, you know, I know our cousin just recently got one about four or six weeks ago. They make a fine automobile and Subaru dealers tend to fall into a category of being more fair with their customers than many other dealers, especially when there was a shortage of Subarus. They were not necessarily adding on $2,500, $5,000 market adjustments at many of the Subaru dealers. Subaru is also a bit more of a just stable brand. And so on this channel, you'll hear us talking about extremes, the brands that have yeah. massive oversupply and massive undersupply. And Subaru's managed to find themselves, they were for a period of time, very, very, very undersupplied. But now in a very good position, you can go get a discount on a Subaru in your neighborhood. Keep it moving. Moving. Yeah, I like that. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you. Bought a car from a dealer, but it's been overheating. Return to fix. Now it's the oil coolant mixed in both systems. Should I return and get my money back? It was a cash deal. Let's talk about that, Dad. This sounds like it was probably a used car. 
Yeah, yeah we have to. We have to. We we're, we're going to guess at some of of some of what we think is going on. So I'm assuming that somebody bought a pre-owned car. Um, don't know if you bought it as is. Don't know if you bought it where it had some type of warranty that came with it. Uh, don't know how long ago you bought it. Um, I don't think that it really matters because in most cases, if it's a used car, you bought it, you own it. Um, it's a terrible thing to say, but that's that's the way it is. So unless it's like something you bought from CarMax and they give you a 30-day to love it or return it policy, and if this is all within that 30 days, then you take it back to CarMax, okay? And you can get your money back or they'll put you in another car. If you bought this from a, 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 a small independent used car dealer or you bought it off of a new car franchise dealership's used car department, you bought it, you own it. Um, so it's not going to be as easy to return it and get your money back as it is like when you buy something at Kohl's and you, you take it home and you go, eh, you know, really, I shouldn't have bought it. And you take it back and they give you your money. It ain't like that. Can you can you explain a little bit what as is when you purchase a vehicle as is? Because you kind of glossed over it. You didn't use okay. the, the exact lingo. Let's explain to everyone what buying a used car as is means, please. That means there's no warranty expressed or implied. Whatever the condition of the vehicle is, the time of sale is the condition of the vehicle. And you assume and accept all liabilities for whatever that condition may be. You have no recourse if if you buy a car as is and it breaks in half after you make the right turn out of the dealership's parking lot you own as they say in the business both halves um and you have no redress yeah so please be be careful when you buy a used vehicle yes. get a pre-purchase inspection is a huge always, always. recommendation yeah, yes absolutely Dad, we've got here from Sarah. Sarah says, Zach, what was the question about the floor plans you mentioned asking the dealership? I didn't write it down. Hmm, what question would I have said around floor plans and asking the sales manager or the dealership? What do you think? How Dad? long How long has a car been sitting on the lot? What's your floor plan interest rates on those cars? How much is your floor plan payment on that car? Uh, what can Mr. Dealer, can you break that down to me, uh, for me on a uh, what it is on a daily basis, or did you want to give me that monthly basis? But whatever it is, I know there's a cost associated with that, and I could do you the favor of doing away with that cost by taking that vehicle off your hands. Assuming, of course, Mr. Dealer, you're willing to work with me, and we can get to a number that works for me and works for you. And Leslie wants to know, what is floor plan? Leslie, happy to help you out. So floor plan is when... A car dealership buys a vehicle. They typically do not pay cash. They finance it just like you or I would, a lot of us would, and they pay an interest rate on that. That interest yes. rate is typically called a floor plan or a floor plan line of credit. And so every day that a vehicle sits on a dealer's lot, it's costing them money, money both in terms of the actual interest expense every day that's being accrued on that vehicle and also the opportunity cost of having that parking space taken up and that capital allocated in that vehicle versus another. So floor plan is the idea of trying to, uh, well, floor plan uh, as a construct is interest payments on a vehicle. And then the idea of turning inventory quickly is to minimize floor plan costs so you don't have all this money tied up in a vehicle. On new cars, the automaker will actually subsidize aspects of floor plan. For so a they'll period like help of time. underwrite. Yeah. yeah. So so it's it's super interesting. It's very much in the weeds of of the industry. Yeah. Uh, here I'll, I'll and I'll give you an example of how, for instance, it would apply in the real estate market. If you see a new spec home or a home that was purchased and then completely gutted and renovated. Well, that's done with the bank's money. They borrow money and they're paying interest on that. And so if, if somebody has a spec home that they built and they would have expected to turn it in 60 days or 90 days having after having completed it, and they're 150 days or 180 days into it, and they're making a $5,000 payment or a $10,000 payment on that every month, um, that, that can take away from whatever profits they hope to have made. So they would be more motivated to sell that house at a at less than the asking price, much like a dealer would be more motivated to sell an aged car, a car that's been sitting on their parking lot for a while, so that they don't no longer have to incur that that interest expense of financing that car. 
We have so many free resources back on CarEdge.com. So if we're going a little too fast or maybe we're explaining things in a way that's not resonating for you, I encourage you to go to CarEdge.com. Resources up here in the top. Click on free guides. Click on cheat sheets. Click on deal school. Click on the strategy card. Click on something under resources. It's all free under there and should help you out. Thanks for the question. Sarah from Frank here, Dad. Yes. Thank Thank you, you, Frank. Frank. Guys, can you explain the lease back acquisition fee and why are dealers charging that up front? So I, I, I don't know what a lease back acquisition fee is, but a lease has an acquisition fee. An acquisition yeah. fee is a profit center for the leasing company. Yes. What, what, what a lease acquisition fee is, is it's an administrative fee that the lease company charges um, when, when they lease a vehicle to you. In, in many cases, it's six hundred ninety-five dollars or seven hundred ninety-five dollars. It might be five ninety-five for some brands, um, but what that is is basically that's profit up front in case you don't keep the lease full term. So it is it is a way to cover some of their expenses. Some brands, um, Honda, Acura, for example, uh, Mini, BMW, uh, Gap Insurance on that lease is included as part of that lease acquisition fee. So they are, they are um, acquiring gap insurance on that vehicle. Toyota, for instance, on a Toyota lease, they do not give you gap insurance as part of their lease acquisition fee. So it's, it's an administrative fee charged by the leasing company to set up that lease. It is basically some front end profit because they're paying for the whole vehicle. You're paying yeah. for a portion of it. They're paying for the whole thing. So they want a little front-end profit up front. Yep, that's exactly it. Um, the leasing company makes money from that, and they also make money from the money factor. Yes. They're buying the money, and then they're, they're, there's an interest component. Leasing is confusing for many people. It's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just an option. Google search car lease, space car edge, or here on YouTube, search for our videos on leasing a car. But hopefully that gives you some additional context on a lease acquisition fee from Jamie. Thank Jamie, you, thanks Jamie. for the kind contribution. What do you think of the mandate for kill switch and the speed governor that manufacturers have to include in cars in 2026? Is it going to affect prices? Wow, I know nothing about this. Do you know anything about this? I, I have read a little bit about it where uh, basically they want to they want to have some type of a, like a breathalyzer um, in all cars. Um, really? It, well, yeah. Will, will it affect prices? If it costs, if there's a cost associated with having to buy that I breathalyzer, heard anything and, about this, Dad. buy that breathalyzer and have it installed, you know, and 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 making that part of the manufacturing process, yeah, ultimately you as the customer are paying for every customer is paying for it. it. It'll get factored into the cost of the vehicle. So will it affect prices? Yeah, the prices of vehicles will go up. Now, I I don't know enough about that as to, is it really going to happen? Is it not going to happen? You know, we, we hear of government programs all the time. I mean, the FTC wanted to institute their, their cars regulations to uh, further enhance their enforcement strategies for how dealers advertise automobiles and, and the actual selling process. Um, but that got hung up in the court. So who knows if and when that any of this will ever happen. I really had no clue that this was even a thing. Uh, I also wonder if there's like a, an aspect of the pricing equation here from a, what's the word? Like not nostalgia. Like I just imagine there's a subset of humanity that doesn't want a car that has that piece of technology in it. And so you're actually like, (laughs) decreasing the addressable market who would buy that type of car well you know it'll, I'm it'll, to, I'm it'll, struggling it'll, to it. it'll certainly be uh, uh, cheaper for those who have been convicted of a dui and or always have to have a breathalyzer i mean i've had to appraise cars that had a breathalyzer in it okay really? yes yeah, yeah, people get arrested for duis of and course then, of course oh, yeah and okay and driving well, is terrible please do not do it be careful. So, Don't and and then, and then oftentimes what happens is, okay, you can, you can continue to drive, but you have to have a breathalyzer in your car and they have to blow into the breathalyzer and, and have not have any alcohol in their breath in order to be able to start the car. Well, guess what is an appraiser. If you go out, if it's not my breath, well, you know, the, the owner has to 
that's the blow into it. So you can so you can do yeah. the appraisal. So, I yeah. can't imagine all cars have, but anyway, maybe maybe that's in the future. Who who knows? Josephine Ruby says, I'm looking at purchasing a Ford Maverick around October. Do you think there will be good deals then? No. <laughs> I will say that we actually had a Ford Maverick hybrid, one yeah. of their uh, team members. Uh, I think it was actually through our concierge car buying service. Mario, keep me honest here because I see you in the chat. I think I think we got they were they were like a thousand under MSRP. Keep me honest, Mario. Was it at MSRP? Let me know in the chat, Mario, because I'm I'm obviously forgetting right now. But uh, there was a hybrid, a Maverick hybrid that we were actually able to get a very good deal on. So I think the deals are out there. It just depends on Jerry region. Jerry got one at MSRP. There you go. So one of our one of our concierges, one of the uh, from our Car Edge car buying service, got one at MSRP. So there you go. Will you get a deal on one? Probably not. Could you maybe find one at MSRP? Evidently, we moved hell and earth yeah. to find one at MSRP of a hybrid. Of a hybrid. Yeah, if you're lucky, more, you could even but, more you know, rare. But Tim are you said, saying are are you saying G is it going to be a deal? Well, I, a deal is a relative term. Kim says, if you see as is, never buy from that dealer. Stating as is only tells me that they know they are shady. If they aren't willing to back it, they know something is not right run. Kim, I appreciate the sentiment. Unfortunately, pretty much every contract for a used car says as is. I think it's like, I don't know if it's mandated, but like even, there, I don't know. I would just, there's a sticker yeah. on every used car, an FTC sticker on every used car that, that explains either the car is sold as is, um, and as is could be, um, it includes whatever remainder there is of, of the factory warranty, or it could be as is, where is, it's just you assume all responsibility, or there could be another box that would say vehicle is sold with a warranty from the dealer. It might be when I first started in the business, we gave a 30-day, 50-50 used car guarantee for the first 1,000 miles. So that if anything along the lines of the powertrain broke in the first 30 days, you would pay half to fix it, and we would pay half to fix it. And I'm pretty sure the half you paid was enough to cover the half it actually it, it actually cost us so that we really didn't pay anything. But <laughs> that's – so one of those boxes has to be checked. Either it's coming with a warranty where there is no warranty and and if the box is checked as is it just there's no warranty on the car it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad car it just yeah. means there's no warranty and there's no warranty that's that's being offered by the dealer on any pre-owned car a pre-purchase inspection goes a long way into giving you a better idea as to what the health of that vehicle may be and you could find a car that's as is for five thousand dollars, and it once you get it inspected, it very well might have a clean bill of health. You're buying it as is, but it still could be a good car. Hundred percent. And and. Getting a warranty is different than getting a vehicle service contract, which is the extended warranty they sell. Yes. So it's, it's some of its semantics as well. I think it's worth yes. calling that out. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Here we go. A little tie bow. Hey. Ooh, ah, ooh. <laughs> okay. Enough of that. How old are you? How old are you, Dad? Next month. And and the good news is, ladies and gentlemen. My birthday falls on a Saturday. So I'm pretty sure we'll be doing Ray's 73rd birthday celebration, assuming he lives that long, um, on on Saturday, May 25th. So 73. Yeah, that's what they tell me. Yeah. You're moving pretty good for a 73-year-old from yeah, O'Head. Yeah, 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 I'm moving. O'Head, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Zach Ray, Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit 5.7 2024. Is it worse to get in the end of May or June? Will discounts from the manufacturer end after the hot spring season? I can assure <laughs> you, oh, head, there is no such thing as a hot spring season for a Jeep dealer right now. You could go try and work a deal this week and they'd be salivating over you. They're probably not going to present best offer on the first go. So make sure Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram dealers are some of the most antiquated, I think. So definitely, definitely be ready to negotiate. But no, I mean, 
there is no hot spring season for Jeep right now. Go try and no, make it. And, and, and from what I understand, a lot of the a lot of the Chrysler Dodge Ram Jeep dealers are upset with Stellantis because they're not seeing big enough incentives from Stellantis. And and Stellantis is like abandoning them and saying, hey, we built them. You figure out how to sell them. <laughs> We're not going to help. You just figure out how to sell them. Yeah, I would go try and make a deal. Try and find a dealer who's willing to work with you. Try and make a deal. We've got Dad here from Enec. Serratable zero, excuse me if I pronounce that incorrectly. Thank you for the kind contribution. Thank you. If I finance a car and the dealer has their name slash logo on the car, can I use that as a negotiation tactic to lower my out the door price? Seems like I could since I'm advertising when I drive around. You know what they'll do for you? They'll take their name right off it. Okay, they ain't gonna pay you to advertise it. Um, you know, I I I, I used to get customers. Oh, I don't I don't want a license plate frame. I don't want anything on there that says where I got it from. No problem. We'll take our sticker off. We won't give you a license plate frame. We don't care. You know why we don't care? Because ninety nine point nine percent of the people don't care if there's a license plate frame on it that says the dealership's name or that there's a decal on the back of the car that says it. So. If you want to be the one person that cares, I don't know, 99 out of the other 100 people are riding around with my license plate frame on the back of the car. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Very infrequently will a dealer you know, take money off of anything. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, people would order cars and well, you better make sure it'll be my pleasure. Don't worry about it. We'll make sure and bring your own yeah. damn license plate frame with you. Okay. From Cappy Ram. Thank yeah. you, Cappy Ram. Appreciate Thank it. You. Should I wait until May, June to buy a used car? I'm in Florida. Thanks. We love this question. When, after what holiday should you be thinking about buying a used car, Pops? Uh, Memorial Day. <laughs> now, now, my dear friend Igor will say you should wait till July. So after July 4th is what Igor would say. He thinks deals will get better in July. I think deals will start to get better towards Memorial Day, the beginning of June. Um, either way, there's a four to six week period of time there that, that four to six weeks might save you some money. Might Who knows? But, but yeah, right now, dealers are paying up to buy their, their used cars at the various auctions. And what I mean by paying up, they're paying more than they had been. And, and wholesale prices have gone up a little bit. So um, I, I think you have to wait two months. So the end of May, um, in June, the end of May, June-ish, you should, be, you should be in good shape. Strong agree. And Cappy Ram, if you have a trade-in or a car you could sell, now's the time to be thinking about selling it. We have obviously carage.com slash sell, but you can go anywhere. The uh, offers right now for trade-ins are higher than they will be two months from now as that seasonality comes to an end. We've got from Charlie, the Unicorn, several Toyota dealerships in this area are listing Toyotas one to $2,000 under MSRP. We have some Toyota dealer partners. They are well below one to $2,000 under MSRP on certain units. There are some vehicles, Dad, like the Tundras. I think you can get between dealer discount and manufacturer rebate up to $4,000 off on a Toyota, which is real sir to say out loud yep then we've got dad from mike's auto parts wants yes. to know if we do podcasts so you can listen while he drives yes our monday through friday show over on the ray and zach channel is called daily news you can use from car edge so just google search that and whatever platform you listen to podcasts on go ahead and give it a listen and if you don't mind give us a rating I didn't realize this, Dad. We have 147 ratings over on the Apple Music or Apple Podcast Store. And generally, people enjoy hanging out with us. So, yes, we have a podcast, Daily News You Can Use from Car Edge. Appreciate you taking an interest in it from Keyword Management Pops. Why yeah. are RAM prices still so high with nothing to, with nothing selling? Riddle me this, Riddler. Me? Because, well, you know why. Because... Uh... Because Ram really isn't supporting their dealers with enough incentives at this at this point, and um, the dealers are still uh, way too proud of all those Rams collecting dust on their lot, and some are trying to set a world record for the number of Rams they can have on one lot. Um, so, 
We did this yesterday over on the Ray and Zach show. Let's do it today for, well, well, for Stellantis. Let's what what I was going to say is is the smart dealers out there, and what I mean by smart dealers when I say that, is dealers that actually pay attention to their inventory. Because the key to running a, a new car franchise dealership or a used car dealership is inventory management. You can't afford to let things sit. So smart dealers are looking at their inventory every flipping day. They want to know how long stuff's been sitting. And when it's been sitting, they make adjustments so that it won't sit any longer. And those adjustments could be they increase the commission for the salespeople when they sell it. Um, they, they, they put together programs for their salespeople. And if you sell certain age units, it'll count as two vehicles instead of one. So it gets you to your sales goal quicker. <clears throat> so a smart, the smart dealers are looking at that stuff that's sitting. Yep. They, they're looking at the expense of what it costs to have it sitting and they're making adjustments price wise. And it, and it appears to me that. <clears throat> Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is bereft of a lot of really smart dealers because a lot of them don't look at their inventory and aren't making the adjustments. Well, you know, yeah. well, it's, well, you got to call. You well, gotta, wait, wait. I want to do an example. I want to do a live example. Okay, Can we do so, a live example? So I don't mean to I don't mean to disparage those. No, the answer to that question was no. <laughs> okay, but you, you just have to if, if so I'll be good now. <laughs> I think my son wants me to stop. <laughs> is there a Guinness World or book, uh, World Record book award for the most Rams on a lot? This is what I want to do, Dad. I actually want to give you yeah. even more of um, of a stage to to have your to have your rant. Do you know of a large Ram dealer? Someone tell me a large Ram dealer. I think I think there's. Dave Smith. I Dave think Smith, they're right. in Idaho or Iowa. So, so watch this. Watch this, okay. everyone. And, and I, believe they're, I, the I believe they're the largest purveyor of Dodge pickup, of Ram pickup trucks, I believe. All right. So everyone, follow along at home if you'd like. CarEdge.com. Click on Car Search. Once you land on this page, go to Resources Dealer Reviews. What dealer did you say? Dave Smith? Dave Smith. All right, I'm gonna wait for this thing to load. Although, oh, I don't even have to wait for it. I can just Dave do that. Smith, uh, Chrysler yeah. Dodge Jeep Ram. There you go. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna click on that. Yeah. I'm gonna click on View Inventory. I am now looking at the one one thousand nine hundred and four vehicles for sale at Dave Smith Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram. So that is a little tap. That's a little hack. Okay. It's not very clear in the user experience, but again, it's under resources, go to dealer reviews, search for the dealer. Now we're looking at the 1,904 vehicles for sale at Dave Smith Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram new. They have 1,580 Ram. They've got 629. Then folks come all the way over here. Where is it? It's under sort days on market oldest. They've got a new 2022 Ram 2500 that they've had for 479 days, Dad. So talk about that Guinness Book of World Records. What would you like to say to Dave Smith, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram? In your opinion, it's all Dave and, Smith, and, Chrysler, I'm, Dodge, I'm, Jeep, and Ram. Before you sue us, it's in his opinion. Damn it. And, well, it's not, and 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 I'm I'm going to say this. They are the largest purveyor of Ram trucks in the United States, from what I understand. They discount much more than anybody else. Um, now, why they would have one for 479 days is beyond me. Um, you know, I, I can't say it was a $66,000 truck or something like that. I can't say that was a price leader. Um, so, you know, why, why is it there? For, I, I don't know. I don't know what all the circumstances are. But my understanding is that, that they sell nationwide. Um, they will beat any local dealer's pricing, uh, and they, from my understanding, are are like the largest truck seller there is, and they, and they're in a small. I mean, like they sm they sell more trucks than the population is in the town in which they're located, from what I understand. So, 
What do you? I mean, they, I, the, the only thing I can tell you about Dave Smith is they get it. And what I mean by that is their whole objective is to sell things as quickly as humanly possible. And they turn their typically turn their inventory quickly. I guarantee you they are looking at, at days on market, um, inventory supply, and they're tracking it daily. All right, folks. Well, there you go. That's what's going on for some RAM dealers. And if you don't want to deal with all that BS, you can use the car buying service back on carhead.com. My all right. Oil, by the way. Yeah. Shannon, thank you for being here. Always good to see you. Thank yes, you, thank, thank you, thank you. you. Enjoy fajitas, love fajitas, and Car mm. Edge, perfect way to spend a Saturday evening. Enjoy the lease info. Shannon, thanks for being here. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. What, what kind of fajitas, uh, uh, Shannon? Are, are they chicken or beef? Or as my son does, he gets chicken, beef, and shrimp. We've got here from Keep It Moving again. Yeah, yes. This was a uh, 2016 BMW X1. Isn't there like a lemon law? Uh, Pops, be gentle and help. Be gentle and I'm help. I'm going to be gentle. Through. There's no lemon law for used cars. Thank you very much. The lemon law applies to new cars. Um, it's a it's a seven or eight year old BMW X1. Uh, unless it came with a, a warranty of some type or an exchange program of some type from the dealer. Um, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. More than likely it did not. Um, you're stuck with the car. Leaks, problems, whatever. You know, you, you, could, you could go in and, and, and my guess is maybe they'll say to you, well, uh, we'll trade you out of it. And I can assure you, you're not going to like the trade-in allowance because you're going. Well, you know, it's got a leak, <laughs> so so we've got to fix the damn thing. So it's not it's not worth as much today as it was when we sold it to you. Um, but yeah, you're you're uh, you're you're pretty much uh, up up a creek without a paddle. That was very gentle, thank you, Dad. Shannon's having beef fajitas. Enjoy. Nice that. choice. Yes, nice choice. Yeah. Enjoy that, Shannon. Enjoy that, Shannon. From uh, Barb. Yeah. Thank you, Barb. Toyota needs more than status quo. The lack of investments in new technology is what got the CEO ousted. They're still using 1980s hyper technology. The interesting thing that we led with, Barb, is Ford just announced this week they're going back to hybrid technology. Like they're taking, they're, they're reducing some of their investments, plan investments in EVs and, and doubling down on hybrid. So I don't know. I don't know if I agree with your take, Barb. I think that's kind of what's made Toyota so profitable. Is that they've got uh, hybrids down, you know, down packed. Yeah, they've kind of perfected the hybrid. And by the way, people want to know if it's Canada dry ginger ale. It is Seagram's ginger ale. Don't ask me how I got hooked on Seagram's. I get nothing from Seagram's for saying Seagram's four times in 15 seconds, although I should send them a bill. Um, but yes, I, I, I rather enjoy my Seagram's ginger ale. Budman wants to know, can you search year range on Car Edge? Yeah, of course you can, Budman. Sorry if it's not that intuitive, but it is right down here. Year and mileage. And now if I just want to look at 2024s to 2025s, there you go. Now we're looking at the 2024s. So yes, we do have that back on the Car Edge. Car Search from Manish, or Manish, excuse me. Manish. Hi, guys. You. Love your channel. Thank you, Manish. Manish, excuse me. Manish. What is a reasonable... Okay, I, I got it. Get it right. <laughs> all right you read this one <laughs> hey guys love your channel what is a reasonable percentage reduction in msrp to ask for in a new rav4 hybrid limited in houston um i don't i don't know the houston market all that well um and i don't know that you're going to get a rav4 hybrid limited below msrp but you will um, you will get, what two three four percent um, let me do the math in my head. You can get it. I mean, shoot for like 500 to a thousand dollars below MSRP, but you might be able to get even more. So what would that be? Maybe it's like a, uh, on the limited, I don't know. What's MSRP on a limited 38, 40, something Call like that. 40. So, so two so, and a half percent. Okay. So, you know, so I said three, four, um, two yeah, to three two maximum, half. according to Igor. There you go. Yeah. Two and a half, somewhere in there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You should not be paying sticker price for one of those. We've got here from Dasha. Yes. I've been getting hustled at every Toyota dealer for a Prius in the last three weeks. Suddenly today they are all calling and emailing about a great deal. Shake my head. 
Wow. Did you did you get back to them to find out what the great deal is? We'd be inquiring minds want to know, Dasha. Well, I, I mean, there is an influx of even Toyota inventory. Yes. Prius, Pri, not so much, but still in general, even Toyota dealers are starting to pick up allocation, which means more deals to be had from Gus. Gus, thank you for the kind thank contribution. You, a family member is upgrading from their 2022 Ford Explorer ST with 26,000 miles and is offering to sell it to me for $33,000. Is it a good idea? Or am I going to be in the shop 24 7? You can answer the reliability question. I'll start to figure out if this is a fair price. I, I don't I don't think you're going to be in the shop 24 um, 7. Car was built during COVID. Um, that's something to consider. Um, you know, and and typically, typically, Gus, the reason that you're in the shop with Fords is well because they lead the league in recalls every year. So, uh, you know, let's assume that most of the recalls are done already. So you might not have to be in the shop. Um, you'd probably, depending upon when your family member bought it, um, you might still have some some factory warranty left. Um, because he, he would have bought it with a three-year, 36,000-mile warranty, whichever occurred first. So, obviously, it's not the miles that have occurred first. I don't know if the time has occurred first yet. Can I show you something, Pops? Yeah, absolutely, buddy. I just put it in the car search, so I'm searching nationwide. Yeah. We've got Ford Explorer ST New. Yeah. Let's add the year here. So, we'll go up to 2022. Oh, my. Well, you, well, there can't be new ones. There's 22 new ones still for sale nationwide. Okay, yeah. Well, they're a lot more than 33 grand. That's what I was looking at. Okay, so MSRPs on these things, obviously with no miles on them. I mean, they're expensive. Holy cow. Yeah. $57,000, $58,000. So I'm looking at that as a bit of a proxy. So we're talking about new vehicle when it was new 55 to sixty thousand dollars so, you know, so you're getting, it, you're getting it, yeah you're getting it at almost 50 percent off for being three years old two years old i think that seems fair yeah i think that seems fair yeah i i you know did you run the used ones here let's look at used ones i was just looking at the new ones because i saw there were some new ones so let's look at just yeah, but, use yeah look at use. see what see what the used ones are going yeah for. i mean look at well here let's do mileage how many miles is on it 26 26 so we'll look 20 to 30 so there's 322 nationwide oh Nope, just 2022. Yeah, just do 2022. There's 136 nationwide. We don't need to be sorted by oldest. Give me a second. Uh, mileage lowest. Okay. I mean, look at these price points, man. Okay. So it sounds like to me that at $33,000, his, his family member is being fair, even if the vehicle is going to be in the shop 24-7. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you still get a pre-purchase inspection buying it from a family member? Why wouldn't you? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to know if there's, if there's going to be any, any issues or if there are any existing issues? Yeah, I mean, not that your family member is trying to stick it to you, but if they haven't had it inspected recently, what do they know? So, yes, of course, get a pre-purchase inspection done. And yes, family a family member is, member selling, is selling it as is. Every time you buy from a private party, you're buying it as is. Unless that private party expressly gives you a warranty, but I don't think that happens. No, it does not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, Dad, I want to come back here. You had an interesting comment earlier, and Sarah says, does a car built during COVID have more issues? Interesting question. What's your take on this? More than likely. And, and the reason I say that... Um, you know, during COVID, it was production lines were, it was hard to keep them filled with all the skilled labor. Um, you know, somebody that whatever their job was on a daily basis might not have been there for 10 days, two weeks if they had COVID. So you might have had somebody else who was slightly less experienced filling in uh, the number of the number of people that might have been missing work. So I, I, 
I, there is a theory going around that the quality of the builds during the COVID period of time is not as high a quality as it would have been prior to COVID and as it may be now after COVID. And then again, there are others who will suggest to you that the quality of the build has has been stinky poo for years. So has been what? Stinky poo. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled a little. <laughs> they smell a little. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. We've got a question here from Happy Chrissy. Where do I find invoice price on cars to see if we are getting a deal off of MSRP? This is a well, really you, great question. Well, first of all, you don't need the invoice price to know if you're getting the deal off of MSRP. MSRP stands for Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price. So if a vehicle has a Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price of $55,295, if you got it for $55,000, you got it off of MSRP. Now, you're being pedantic. I don't think that's the point, but yeah. Now. That was a good use of the word pedantic. I'm, I'm, I, you, for for two college graduates, I mean two college dropouts. I'm proud of you for throwing pedantic into into our live stream tonight. Now, where do you get the invoice price? It's hard to get the invoice price. So you can ask the dealer to share the invoice with you. Now, if I was still running a dealership and you asked me to show you the invoice, I would, and I would also assure you that in today's market that I won't be selling you the card invoice, that it'll be somewhere between invoice and MSRP. That's wrong. That's wrong. Hate, hate to call you out on it, man. That's a bad blanket statement. We see it day in and day out. There's our Mazda dealer partners are selling yes. cars 3% below invoice. Our Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram dealers are selling cars way below invoice. So I don't think that's a fair... Okay. Our four dealers are selling I below. Stand, I stand. I happy, Chrissy. I stand corrected. Ask the dealer to share the invoice with you. If they will, great. You can take a look, and then you can figure out what you want your offer to be. If they won't, go to another dealer who will. I would also say, Chrissy, we have a community forum. People share invoice prices on the community forum all the time. So I would, you know, use forums, things like that. You can ask for invoices. But sorry, Dad, I just use pedantic and. Yeah, and correct the John Price rate. I mm, 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 show mm. could be coming to an end. <laughs> yeah, this, this channel might be over soon. We don't know. Barb, thank you, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Clarification: We're longtime Toyota, some hybrid family. Uh, we're a longtime Toyota family. Yeah, I think they need to invest in new hybrid technology, not 1980s. Great show, by the way. Yeah, Barb, I think you're probably right. But mm. I will also say, capitalism is a weird thing. The moment you can drive costs down and keep prices high and you make more money, they're going to stick with it. So that 1980s technology might be around for a while, a while longer. Let's come here, Dad, to Miguel. Miguel excuse me. Thank, Thank you, Miguel. Miguel. Hey, how much should I pay for a Toyota 2024 4Runner SR5? How much under MSRP? Thank you, guys. I've learned a lot so far. If I'm not mistaken, you should be aiming for somewhere between $1,000, $2,000 below MSRP on one of these. Uh, I could be off a little bit there. We have on the car search our fair price algorithm or our target discount, but I'd be aiming for a thousand to two thousand below M and S and R and P. Thank you, thank you very much, Mister Pandantic. Yeah, Pandantic, whatever it is. What was it again? <laughs> Pedantic. <laughs> Pedantic. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. CarEdge.com, folks. If we can help you out with anything, please go check it out. We've got the car search. We can help you sell and trade a car. We've got our market insights that can help you negotiate a deal, our car buying service, our protection plans, how everything works about me and my dad, our story, our company, everything in between, and all the free resources we have to share with you all here back on CarEdge.com. That's us, folks. That's us? That's, That's us, us in Las Vegas, ladies and gentlemen. That was where favorite. those pictures were taken when our first professional photographic shoot was uh, first and really kind of only. We've done two. Okay, so first, this still qualifies as the. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, and that and that was done over about a eight or nine hour period of time. 
good day, man. It yeah, day. in Las Vegas. We had a lot of fun that day. We did have a lot of, uh, lot of fun. Cesare and Debbie. All right, folks. I'm going to call it a night. I'm tired. You tired? How you doing, man? <laughs> Buddy, I'm, I'm flying on the Seagram's ginger ale. Can I tell you something? I had seven pieces of pizza before we came on to tonight's show. I only had five. Did you have pizza? I did, yes. And you had five pieces? Yes. How big were the pieces? Normal size. You know, not not, Wait, not like gigantic. Normal, like... Not giant ass size. You know, just it was a 14 inch pizza and I ate five slices. Like that big? I ate I ate one more slice than I should have. That big? Maybe a little bigger. That big? There you go, yeah. Good yeah. five of those? I'm a growing guy. What do you you know? I had you... seven. Wow. And you haven't fallen into a food coma yet? We're getting close. All right, folks, let's keep it going. Barb. <laughs> Way too much pizza. Barb, thank you. So you're saying my dream of getting anything off of a 2024 Grand Highlander hybrid is not happening. Sad Panda, correct. The Grand Highlander hybrid at MSRP is a deal without all the crapola add-ons. That's what you should be shooting for. Um, Matt Barb from Mark F. Can you assist us in selling our BMW 3 Series in Honolulu, Hawaii? Really appreciate the contribution, Mark. Probably not. I don't think we have any network in uh, in Honolulu for selling a car. I would say um, we have a guide on how to sell your car for the most money possible. Use those tactics with your local dealers would be my my recommendation. Yeah, and you know, I uh, privately try and sell privately if yeah. it's a nice car. Yeah. Really big brain thinking here from our community, Dad. Chris says, fold it in half and it's smaller. So that's no, actually a really... Yeah, really I had two and a half slices. <laughs> I had three and a half. Uh, yeah, you fold it in half one more time. Yeah. Anyway, all right, Dad. I'm going to go back home and have a good night. I love you very much. Thank you for doing the show. And I'll see you tomorrow. Well, thank you. Yeah, does that mean we're working tomorrow? We're filming tomorrow? We're doing videos tomorrow? Yes, <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. We hope you enjoyed a little Saturday Night Live with Car Edge, and uh, hopefully we will be back here next Saturday with more of this nonsense. And if you can't get enough of us and you can't wait till next Saturday, we'll be on the Ray and Zach channel at noon Eastern at Monday through Friday for, well, the news that you can use from Car Edge. Love you too, handsome. Thanks, uh, thanks for doing this tonight. Mwah. Bye.